table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Greg Carr, and this is our weekly hour when we spend time thinking about issues of specific concern to people of African descent and to others fighting for a better society. As we know, here at the Black Table, we have regular guests and segments, and one of our regular segments is our legal roundtable. Today, we are joined by, again, by Professors Angela Porter and Valethea Watkins, but this is a special edition of our roundtable. As we think about here at the table, how we jailbreak the concept of gatekeeping and hierarchy and the distinctions between those who might see themselves only as academics or only as community workers or activists, we don't honor those categories here at the Black Table. We're all learning and taking this journey together. And we're here at this special edition for a moment that we're gonna look back on and say, this is a moment when everything shifted in the field of legal studies and legal academia with, with regard to the study of people of African descent. We're here on the occasion of the publication in volume 27 of the Michigan Journal of Race and Law of Professor Porter's new article, Africana Legal Studies, a new theoretical, fr- uh, a new theoretical approach to law and protocol. So here at the Black Table, we're welcoming back our regular legal round table, Angela Porter and Valethea Watkins. Welcome, welcome professors. Thank you, good to be with you. Thank you. Thanks for yeah. having me and thank you for that very generous introduction. <laughs> well, I wanted to get y'all on screen before we get into this. Uh, everybody should know by now, of course, that we are a longtime friend and colleagues. So the three of us having this conversation, you know, it's an honor to, to be able to, to do this. I don't know that there's a precedent for folks to just tune in and have a conversation about a law review article that is so grounded in and pertinent to them. Um, I'll mention that when uh, Professor Watkins and myself were in law school, we had an old law professor, Leroy Purnell, who was the former dean at Florida A&M University of Law at Ohio State. And, you know, I remember approaching him with the possibility. I said, you know, could we talk about my eye in the law? And at that time, in the in the late eighties, there really wasn't anybody around to have that conversation with. He certainly was enthusiastic, but you know, he said, "I have no familiarity with that. I have no concept of how we might even approach that." And so, clearly, clearly, we were waiting on you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, ma'at, of course, is an ancient Egyptian term, a comedic term, doesn't really translate into English, as as our brother Mario Beatty would tell us, but. Professor Watkins, um, I don't know if you have any opening thoughts before we turn to this article and and spend our first block asking you, Professor Porter, how you came to this. And there are very few people. You quote Ken Nunn. uh, You mentioned Sophie White and a handful of others that might gesture toward the idea of grounding the study of law uh, against something that is much more ancient in many ways. And you, you coined the term protocol. And then explore some African terms, but Professor Watkins, do you have any initial thoughts before we uh, ask Professor Porter to jump in and walk us through this article? Well, I I would just like to begin by saying thank you to Professor Porter for this beautifully written, deeply researched, and masterful, I mean, masterful article. Uh, It is a masterful demonstration of the application of the Africana Studies conceptual framework uh, developed by Dr. Carr and it is going to be a powerful contribution to our collective conversation about consciously re-engaging and relearning and reconnecting um, to what Dr. Carr refers to as that unbroken genealogy that exists. So I would say uh, I'm so excited. I was so excited when it was published. I am so excited that it's going to be available to our community. Um, because as Dr. Carr said, in terms of jailbreaking, it is a demonstration of that in so many ways, because um, I would say to people, do not sleep on the footnotes. They are a tour de force. They're so, um, um, the article is so well written and so tight and cogent that it's highly readable and highly accessible. And it's such a demonstration of our um, cultural tradition. So I, you know, I just want to start at the beginning, like Dr. Carr said, and and have you share with us how did you come to this topic, and what did you hope to accomplish with this article? Hmm. Well, wow, wow, <laughs> y'all, 
thank you. <laughs> I, you know, I don't even know how to receive all of that. I just thank you so much for those words. And I really want to start by saying, um, when you ask, how did I come to this? I didn't come to this. Um, this to me is a, it's a collective work product. It's collective in a couple of ways. One, the larger project of centering our people on our own terms has been in play since time immemorial um, of African people thinking about themselves and studying themselves. That's something that you, Dr. Carr, stress when describing the Africana Studies framework. So I want to say that. But this is also a collective project. This article itself is a collective work because it is the product of so much collaboration um, and not just from workshopping the article, but really discreet conversations with you two. And uh, <laughs> I remember certain points that really shaped this article. I mean, it comes out of our discussions. And so I see us as a team of collaborators and I'm fortunate enough to be part of that collective and it expands beyond the three of us, but you two certainly are um, major contributors to this work. So I just want to start there. Well, let, but, me, let me remember very quickly that your collective, and again, I want to echo what Valethea said. We can now dispatch with the professors and such. <laughs> but uh, what Valethea said, your footnotes are literally a read through of generations of collective work. Everybody from Marimba Ani and Anderson Thompson to Jacob Carruthers and Ken Nunn so many others and as you stress in each of the themes each of the 70 uh plus pages 72 pages of this article you know this is a collective work and you of course quote chancellor williams um it's really a remarkable document it's something that we in terms of the thrust would be very familiar with in terms of those communities of black folk who are trying to do this thinking work but you've projected this out into the world now in a way and it is open source and though y'all pay attention as as angie walks us through what that means uh but it also it's not critical race theory so folks who might think oh critical race in fact you have displaced race for the much stronger and relevant grounding context of culture so uh I'm going to yeah, it, maybe in part in, in the second section, we'll, we'll ask you to read from it because the way you open, I think, the article in, in, in Vlithi, I think we both agree it's cinematic. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing short of cinematic. So well, our people are cinematic. You know, I always say that there's so many stories and when I'm teaching and now, you know, I have this, this privilege of being a teacher. Um, I always am saying, where's my HBO series? Where's my film? Every time we talk about the stories of African people resisting, organizing, governing themselves, I'm like this is cinematic. And, you know, I say it in jest because so we don't need HBO. You know, we don't want HBO. <laughs> for, but but it's to make the point of what you just said, which is these stories are so powerful. They speak to us more than the stuff that we watch on TV and on, on screen, so. That's right. So how did you uh, come to it? We, we, we've got just a couple of minutes in the first block. Okay. But it didn't start with you coming to law school, right? You've been thinking about Africa for a very long time. <laughs> Indeed. It's interesting how time works and perhaps we'll continue this in the next segment, but um, a pivotal moment in my life was sitting in your classes, Dr. Carr, at Howard, 2006 to 2010 as a student and learning that Africana Studies framework. Which we developed and, together, by the way. It was on that team. We wrote that curriculum in Philadelphia. You know, I worked on the AP Studies, African American Studies curriculum, but let's be very clear. That's not African American Studies. What we're doing, Africana Studies, we did that collectively. That was collective work too. So yes. it was collective and we're a team, but you were the quarterback. So that's there, we go. <laughs> there we go. So I'm always okay. saying. All right. All right. <laughs> African studies framework. People are like, get on with it. No, I'm uh, and, but it's interesting how time works because that framework then gives us a way to see the world. And now I can look back with hindsight to my childhood and, and filter it through those the, that first part of your framework. So I'll just introduce it here and then I would love to continue this story. Let's do it. But, um, the, so the framework has six 
conceptual categories. The first two are the paradigm shift. Yes. This is how I'm experiencing it. Yes. You have to correct me. But the first two, social structure and governance, are the paradigm shift. And I say that because quickly I'll say uh, social structure is all about the landscape African people find themselves in. You crystallize it by saying, who are we to other people? Who are African people to others? Governance is our thing. Who are we to each other? The structures we create for ourselves, how we order the universe as African people. And the other categories all combine into um, that world. But you could sort of stop at step two and be in a completely different mindset is what I'm saying. So the shift is required. You, you start thinking about who African people are to others and you proceed in who are we to each other. And you could spend your whole life <laughs> in the social structure framework. Absolutely. We often do. Many people and, and us, we often do. Yeah. You could spend your whole life dealing with social structure, grappling with that. And I think um, much of my childhood was concerned with governance, but thinking my life has to be in this social structure. And um, this project sort of flows from the conclusion that that is wrong. It doesn't have to concern social well, structure. Why don't we, uh, we pick up with that um, after we take our first break? And I do want to mention in closing that uh, coming out of that strong family that you come out of, you know, the Texans and the Minnesotans and everyone else, you were trained very well to to, to, uh, to do everything. And she won't say it, but, uh, you know, straight A's from the beginning of school all the way through getting to law school, clerked in federal spaces, was the police for a minute on the city side, <laughs> worked in big law. So this is this is to the social structure. It doesn't get any more accomplished than Angie Porter, Georgetown Law Fellow, now on the faculty of American University. Uh, so editor of Howard's Law Journal, editor of the Law Journal. That's right. The Howard Law Journal. And so uh, but now you're here and uh the game is about to be reframed. So we're coming back on the other side of the break with Angie Porter and Felipe Watkins here at the Black Table. Introducing this powerful article, Africana Legal Studies, a new theoretical approach to law and protocol. Back in a moment. Big Tobacco targets black communities with marketing for menthol cigarettes. In the 1950s, less than 10% used menthol cigarettes. Today, it's 85%. FDA, ban menthol cigarettes, save lives. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of black America. All the momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Welcome back to the Black Table here at the Black Star Network. Greg Carr with Lethia Watkins and Angela Porter, our regular legal roundtable. And uh, Angie, you were about to uh, continue in this conversation how you got to this. And um, Netta, I think, is the name that you propose instead Absolutely. of protocol. You said we got to even leave that language alone at some point. But please continue. Absolutely. Yes. The comedic, the comedic term. Um, well, I grew up in Minnesota and I grew up in a very black family. <laughs> people think that, you know, every time I say Minnesota, people will ask me, are there black people there? And I say, yeah, of course, you know, we're everywhere. That's right. And I grew up in a small city, Rochester, Minnesota, where people came to that city to work. So they would either work at Mayo Clinic or IBM had a pretty vibrant hub there for a while we did have this sizable black community. It's still there. 
And I think it was big enough to maintain some institutions, black churches, but it was small enough to where it was very cohesive. And I only realized that after I left Rochester that, wow, our community was tight. We all, you know, all the families knew each other. We, there were the, the socioeconomic boundaries were not in play. We were all just together. And so that had a big impression on me, but it created this split of experience. You know, I would go to school and be in what I would characterize now as the social structure and come home just like my parents would come home and we would have our governance conversation, sure. our governance world. And I sort of just thought that's the way of the world, you know, to, to quote Earth, Wind and Fire, <laughs> that's the way of the world. Um, and my parents were so just naturally intentional about making sure we knew our history making sure we were confident and um, comfortable being us and being excellent at what we did. Um, but again, there was this, you go to school, that's social structure. Ultimately, by extension, you'll have a career, that's social structure. When you come home, you come home to your family, your community, you know, you're active in community, but that's just the way of the world. I come to the HBCU, Howard, um, and I sit in Dr. Carr's classes <laughs> and I get this framework um, and I don't even get it in, the, in those four years. I'm learning it, but I'm not like consciously understanding what has shifted. I just know something has shifted. And it's really in hindsight, the primacy of the social structure in my life, it's understanding, oh, I can be 100% about governance structure, no matter where I am, no matter whether I'm the police, as you say, um, no matter where I move in the spaces I go into, I can carry that center with me. I can center African people. And, that, and that's a very prominent element in your work how we have to navigate those worlds. And in every space that you've been in, in terms of your legal training and then your work as a lawyer, public and in, in, in big law and private firms, you found ways to infuse that work with governance logics and ways of knowing and culture meaning making. And, and as you trace the history of the Bamana people in Louisiana and, and, and before that set this framework, could you say a little bit about the tensions between law as we think about it and protocol as you've introduced this kind of new theoretical framework for us to give give some language to something we all experience, but particularly those folk out there who practice law, who study law, and young people who are thinking about going to law school. Any any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, one of the big tensions, well, there's two, there's two main tensions that we have to contend with as a threshold matter. One is that the governance conversation is missing from the discipline of law. I mean, when we go and we learn law, and I went to Howard University School of Law, so I'm still at the HBCU, but the discipline itself is inherently Western. It's inherently talking about European governance. So Africa is missing from that equation. And I remember looking at case books as I'm going to class and reading the books and writing in the margins Where's Africa? Because they would mention Greece and Rome. <laughs> These books would go all the way back to classical Europe. Um, and they would really sit in medieval England and all of this. And you're thinking, where's Africa? And where are Africans? But I didn't really understand back then how to um, think about that fully. Well, but I knew something was missing. Well, I'm thinking about the special issue of the Howard Law Journal y'all edited when you went after Abraham Lincoln. I mean, that, <laughs> that's in the arc of, unfortunately, a lot of what we think is black uh, black intellectual work in the legal spaces. And of course, Valethea, you remember when we were in, in, in law school, I mean, we were we came of age during the curriculum wars of the late 80s and early 90s. And of course, we've had uh, Baba Marie with Kelsey, Kelsey here on the black table. And 
we would we would be deep into Africa, the study of Africa. But when we went into contracts and sell pro, we had not yet figured out a way to bring that in. I don't know if you. <laughs> yeah, you know, that the the initial way we try is um, when everyone else was getting joint. Well, not everyone, but people were getting joint degrees in um, law and MBAs or law and public policy. We petitioned the law school to uh, allow us to get a joint degree in law and Africana studies, and they had agreed to that. Right. And so we we were we were trying to walk that walk. Like, wait a minute, we need to bring our right. studies into the law, oh. right? And then yeah, it's everybody's like grappling with this. I think um, wow. I was imagining okay, we would have a case book on torts or contracts, but it would only involve cases uh, about black people. It would only have cases would be like black torts. You know, I used to think of stuff like that. Um, but I just knew something was missing. There was black a tort. Yeah, 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 yeah. Blackness is a tort. Right. <laughs> we have been harmed. Blackness is a tort anyway. Right. Tort, but, okay. by the way, okay. means, uh, are wrong in uh in, oh, in law. No question. Um, but I also was, when I was editor in chief of Howard Law Journal, I was writing my journal comment and it was all about Kemet, ancient Egypt. But I had to figure out the legal hook and I had to tie it to international law and uh, antiquities law. Let's, and let's get the it. name of that um, article. It's called Pharaohs, Nubians, <laughs> and Antiquities. International law suggests it's time for a change in Egypt. That yeah. was by <laughs> Angie Porter. How there it is. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Batman, that's right. That's right. I'm sure people are like, wait a minute. Yeah, this isn't CRT or critical race theory. Uh, <laughs> would call it CRT without knowing what it is. It's a different, okay. So, so I mean, I, I, I don't think either of us uh, are, um, know anyone who has been more deeply ensconced in the workings of Western law, certainly American law, than you, Angie. I mean, you you worked for a federal judge. You worked at state, local, federal government as a lawyer. You know what 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 did you see there in terms of these tensions between law and and what emerges as protocol in the daily lives of people who find themselves before the bar? Oh yeah, I mean that was an odyssey. It was a circuitous path through the <laughs> legal profession. Um, well. The thing that kept happening, and I, I really think back to when I was prosecuting for the city of Minneapolis, which was a very short stint. It was a part of our training as uh, trial lawyers at the firm. They would loan us out to the city. And so I'm, as you call the police, I'm prosecuting and I have um, both victims. So as the prosecutor, you represent the city and the people in it, the citizens. So I'd have victims over here. And then I had the victims of the criminal justice system, the defendants who I'm prosecuting. And there was this cultural thing of this feeling of this is just wrong mm -hmm. by all of the Africans. And when I say Africans, I mean it in our Africana sense, a broad sense, continental and diasporic Africans, African-Americans included in that. It's what you explain in the article. Yeah. So that, so you had a sense that they that as you write in the footnotes of this article, people everybody, including you, said this system is not for us. Right. You oh, just yeah. knew. I mean, we all knew. We we're all looking at each other. I'm prosecutor. I'm looking over at the, <laughs> you know, the parties. My God. Um, and we're all just like, we know that this is messed up. And we know this is wrong. And there's something about when you are the in the professional role, right? As a as a black lawyer. And you can look at someone who is in the defendant's chair and y'all are looking at each other at the same level. And even the judge, remember Valithia, when we were in law school, the great Bruce Wright, turn them loose, Bruce. Yeah. White judge. Black Rose. That was one of Valithia's favorite phrases. <laughs> I love it. I love that book. That's a great book too. Um, yeah. But you just look at each other and you know, and, 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 and it's, it's not for us. It's almost like, how did we get here? Mm. How did you and I, how did we get here? I would have, you know, Africans from uh, uh, Central and South America who might call themselves Afro Latino, mm. who we would call Africans in the Western Hemisphere. Same thing. We're looking at each other like, 
Yeah, this is this is crazy, ain't it? Crazy, right? <laughs> so those moments became moments for me to really um, reflect on and decide how I was gonna move, what my next moves would be. When I was clerking, I remember sentencing, sitting through many sentencing hearings. One after which I broke down in the bathroom because I was just watching my brother out there. Mm. Not my biological brother, but I I saw my brother, his face right there. Mm. This person was being sentenced and I just thought, yeah, what are we doing? Well, <laughs> what are we doing here? That drove you back into the academy where you can now begin to train others to. Well, absolutely. But I also thought I never left this conversation. Oh, no question. I, I was, again, um, fortunate enough to remain part of this team doing this work. And a lot of that has to do with ASCAC, the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, other community organizations I participated in, Minnesota Association of Black Lawyers. I mean, I had to keep tethered to this collective work. Um, so then I head back to the formal academy to try to find space where I could deal with these questions full time. I mean, that was really the draw. It was um, not having to do the social structure thing where I would be a lawyer and then come home and think. It was giving myself time to think mm. so and be of service to our community. Um, so really that that was the mechanism to be able to do the important work, which is to be in conversation with you all and figure out a way out of, I guess what Dr. Anderson Thompson would call this mess that we're in. Yes. Yes. Well, with that, with that preview of where we're about to go next for the rest of the show, uh, when we come back, uh, Prof, we're going to ask you to jump right into Africana Legal Studies. Tell us what it is. Tell us what it isn't. And tell us how you use one distinct group of Africans, the, Bab the Bamana people, in one place in the United States, Louisiana, to begin to explore the possibilities of thinking about protocol as opposed to law. So we're going to be back in a moment with Angela Porter and Lethia Watkins at our legal roundtable discussing Africana legal theory when we come back at the Black Table. Back in a moment. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Remember to support the Black Star Network, join the Bring the Fun Fab Club, and support us across all of our platforms. You're not going to have these conversations anywhere else. Uh, Professor Porter, when we left, we were right walking right up to the edge of the Michigan Journal of Race and Law in your article. Uh, would you mind reading the first two paragraphs of this article just to give people a little taste of what they're going to get into? I'm going to start with a quote at the beginning. African people have produced the same general types of institutions for understanding and ordering their worlds as every other group of human beings. Though this should be obvious, the fact that we must go to great lengths to recognize and then demonstrate it speaks to the potent and invisible effect of the enslavement and colonization of African people over the last 500 years. That's Greg Carr. Mm -hmm. We got to start there. And Valethea Watkins and all of our teachers, Marie Kelsey and uh, Anderson Thompson, and Jake Carruthers. Yes. So that's the Africana Studies Thrust. Okay. All right. All right. I see you got me. Now, okay. y'all get ready. Y'all get ready. Now, imagine this thought in your mind. Go ahead and read this. All right. All right. <laughs> all right. In 1743, a group of enslaved Africans from various estates in French colonial New Orleans, rather, gathered 
held a musical ceremony sung in their native language and discussed the actions and fate of a slaveholder named Corbin. Earlier, Corbin had threatened to shoot one of the enslaved Africans in this group. And Corbin's brother then actually shot that person with a gun loaded with salt. Now, as the group of Africans gathered, they determined that Corbin had to die. Two months later, Corbin's, Corbin disappeared and was never found. Hmm. If we use a traditional Western legal framework to describe this situation, we might say that this group of slaves met, conspired, plotted to murder, and likely did murder Corbin. But if we center this perspective of these enslaved Africans and contemplate that they had their own home cultures with their own systems of justice brought with them from Africa, we might rephrase. These Africans convened and judged Corbin's conduct, sentenced him to death, and likely executed him. Hmm. So, so those those, people, those Africans were uh, Bamana. Huh? Well, this is from Gwendolyn Midlow Hall's work, and she's yeah. looking through the colonial archives, letters, court records. And it's not clear who um, exactly these Africans were, what nations they belong to. But we do know <laughs> that the Bamana people are, you know, they are thick in no, colonial New Orleans. I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> so. sorry but I believe you. Footnote six just makes me laugh out loud every time. <laughs> well, okay, let's see what is footnote six. Yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay. They evidently sent us. Corbin to death and carried out his execution. Corbin disappeared after going out to hunt and one of the members of this group, oh yes, named Jeannot, threatened another slaveholder by saying, he knew who killed Corbin. <laughs> oh, he, you know, the others know what went down. And they're like, I mean, be careful. This is contemporary. <laughs> Black people have a hey man, you watch out now. I know kill Corp. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so, so and we laugh it, but I mean, what's the difference that you, you, you make this distinction between governance and social structure, but protocol. In other yeah. words, they're not just randomly out here. What, talk, walk us through that. Uh, and believe you jump in, please, at any moment, because, you know, this theory is grounded in this concept that these people have rules and they didn't forget the rules. You write beautifully right. about how these rules didn't evaporate as they came across the water. You yeah, talk those about are your two two major concepts, you make a real distinction between protocol and law, and you say they should not be equated. So yes, just walk us through what protocol is. Thank you. Uh, well, and also, uh, Dr. Watkins, thank you for helping me with the Corbin story because you, your help was there. So I gotta give you a shout out. <laughs> you, we workshopped that. And so now it has come together very nicely, thanks to you. Um, protocol. Okay, so we have the subject matter and we have the approach to what we're talking about. The subject matter is African people governing themselves, African people having their own systems to select leaders, to organize society, to address wrongdoing, to ensure people stay in their promises, you know, ways to relate to land, et cetera. And that's the first thought. The second thought is they bring this with them, as you mentioned. It doesn't just evaporate out of their heads. There's no neuralizer from Men in Black in the middle of the Atlantic that says, okay, forget all that. Or they're not just gonna remember their music and forget how to resolve disputes. And shout out so, to our colleague, Addison Francois. You pointed on page 304. <laughs> if they brought with them their clothes, their food, and their religion, did they forget their laws? If they knew how to raise their babies, did they forget how to resolve disputes? That's a beautiful quote from Brother Brother Francois. Yes. And that and and uh, Professor Francois said that to me as I was developing this this uh, mm. paper. So thank you to him for that. Absolutely. So Africans are bringing everything with them in their minds. That's the subject matter that Africana legal studies deals with. But the how 
do we approach it is a big question. Do we call it African law? Do we call it African customary law? There are a lot of people out in the world with good intentions who want to call it that, yes. who do call it that. And I don't. <laughs> and, and, and I, and I you maintain. Know, right. You, you actually examine a lot of those arguments. You even go back to the early 20th century with uh, J. Casey Hayford. And I mean, you're looking at those lawyers. And you also are very careful to say those who dismiss this as are they romanticizing Africa. You say, uh, to quote the, the late John Bracey, who we had here, people are spending these uh, theories on very thin margins of knowledge. Nobody ever asked them to say, well, what's your evidence for that? You, you're like a prosecutor in these pages going after these people who say, you shouldn't be talking about Africa, but go. <laughs> right. Maybe that prosecutorial experience paid <laughs> off. But um, uh, The key there, I think, comes from Dr. Jacob Carruthers. And there was a, there was a pivotal moment where Dr. Carr, you led me to his History Makers interview Done by um Baba Larry Crow. Great Larry Crow and at the yeah. black table, no question. <laughs> yes, and and Dr. Carruthers in that interview just lays out how he comes to this concept of African deep thought. He says he's moderating moderating this question of is there philosophy in Africa? And he has three steps to this. One, philosophy is a European discipline. It arises out of a European worldview, has European theorists, European uh, constructs. Therefore, two, we shouldn't search for philosophy in Africa. Mm -hmm. Three, that doesn't mean that Africans didn't have deep thought or deep thinkers. When I saw that, I thought, yeah, okay, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> This is a transferable concept. This is not limited to that philosophy discussion or any, this is for the whole collective project, okay? Including our little corner over here dealing with governance and law. So law is inherently European. It arises out of a European worldview. The thing that we study when we go to law school is European governance. The thinkers are from Europe. They figure black people in at the 11th hour. But up until then, it's the foundation is laid out from a Western worldview. And by all, you don't mean rules. You, 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 and you, oh, you yeah. a phrase, a term, a love, qualified law orientation. Is that mm -hmm. what, what is it? Yes, the qualified law orientation is this improper imposition of legal constructs, Western legal constructs onto cultures that are outside of the West. Um, and that is in the same conversation. So we shouldn't search for Western legal constructs in Africa. That doesn't mean Africans didn't have governance. And when we talk about governance in this conversation with law, we have to call it something else. We call it protocol. That helps us break away. That helps us break the chain, as Dr. Carter said, that links African ideas and European ideas. We have to have this as uh, Dr. Oyuranke Oyuwumi would say, and Dr. Watkins has taught me all about her. Uh, we have to have an epistemic rupture. Mm. We have to depart from these constructs that are so prevalent and ubiquitous. So we must call it something different. So mm. just like African deep thought, we call it protocol. And we, come, we came to that term. You point out that it's not equivalent it's not lesser. Okay. It's so, not lesser. And it's not the same thing. It's something beyond. Absolutely. So, so when I tell students, about, yeah, when I tell students about protocol or people about protocol, generally they there's this knee-jerk reaction that, oh, well, you know, it's something lesser. Folk it's culture or diminished culture. Yeah, mass culture. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Distinct doesn't mean lesser. That's right. So, I don't yeah. want to. I don't want to. We, we're right up against the break. And we're gonna come back in a second. We got one more block. So, when we come back, we pick up right there because you really uh, allow us to think about how this, how we can apply this in the temporary moment. So, uh, when we come back here at the Black Table with uh, Angie Porter discussing her article, introducing Africana legal theory to the world, uh, we are going to continue this conversation. So, we'll be back here at the Black Table. Back in a moment. Thank you. 
For decades, the tobacco industry has deliberately targeted black communities and kids with marketing for menthol cigarettes. It's had a devastating impact on black health. Tobacco use claims 45,000 black lives every year. It's the number one cause of preventable death. In the 1950s, less than 10% of black smokers used menthol cigarettes. Today, it's 85%. Ban menthol cigarettes. Save lives. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, you're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 2037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Remember, support the Black Star Network. Join the Bring the Funk fan club. It is your support that allows us to have these conversations. Um, Angie, as we were, uh, you know, it was far too short. We're going to have to have you back and have a con continuing conversation. Near the end of the article, you say that a consciousness of protocol allows us to do so many things not just as black folk or people of African descent of Africans, but in terms of contributing to our larger humanity. Could you talk a little bit about what this theory allows us to do? Not only mm -hmm. as, as, as legal scholars and lawyers and, and, and folks involved in law, but just generally in terms of this broader concept of intellectual work. Well, I think it allows us to imagine something different from what we're in now. And um, when you take stock of what's happening and you see, at least for African people, what's happening is an interaction between two systems. Um, you can question the very premise of one. The system is no longer, the system of law is no longer an absolute truth that can't be questioned. So for example, Law says, I can go outside and look at that patch of land out there and I can circumscribe it and I, an individual, can own that. And that when I own that, there are things I should do. There's things law incentivizes me to do. One of those things is to develop that land, to improve that land and build on it. The very premise of that can be questioned if you have this other as Dr. Carruthers might characterize, deep well of knowledge from another governance tradition. The thing is, people are questioning law, but they are doing so while um, just sort of riffing on, <laughs> just just being creative and with nothing that they're and, tying it to. And, and still very much anchored in race as opposed to culture. Mm -hmm. You make that distinction. In fact, and for those of you who will read this article and think about it, you spend the bulk of this article comparing how these Bamana people and by extension at people of African descent compare their protocols to this quote unquote qualified law um, orientation and how, you know, they, they reject certain things, make certain things. You know, we don't take these oaths you take. We don't have, you know, we don't look at the collective work the same. And you compare the code noir as it develops in Louisiana with what these Africans are doing. And you establish the fact that while we may live in this social structure, we've, we have our own rules, our own elders, our own communities, as you say. And out of that, that's how we resolve disputes. And it's very, it should be very familiar to folk who, again, thinking about the class analysis, who are not um, 
steered toward as you were, as I was, as Dr. Watkins was, and so many of us are, to go to the university to somehow find the framework to help our people. I mean, that's why they're flailing. No, this this is found in the neighborhoods. Right. <laughs> this is found on the street court. This pro, you, you talk about at the feet of the elders. Go ahead. Say, go ahead. Go ahead. It's found at the feet of the elders. And so, you know, can you you elaborate? You make a distinction between Africana study as subject matter uh, as opposed to Africa, disciplinary Africana studies, the what we study versus the how we study. Can you highlight that a little bit more? Yeah. So what we just said, the, the, the how African people are doing things differently. I mean, that's the subject matter. But the way we approach it is the method. That's the methodology. And so it has to be African centered. And that's why we do things like call this protocol and not law to break away from those constructs that we are importing from the West. I mean, it's like, you know, Terminator vision. If you have a headgear on and you're scanning the landscape, you got all these like computations going, you're using this Western architecture, this framework to analyze Africana. And you're going to find things that you're programmed to find, but that's not necessarily the reality. So it's a, it's incompatible. So the methodology, the coding in your headgear has to be different. And I always try to go back to this notion of we need to let the cultures speak for themselves. As Dr. Crother said, we need to let the ancestors speak for themselves without listen to the voice of the ancestors without European interpreters. Absolutely. You 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 you, you say the man said uh, uh, he is lying in court, and then you say right. <laughs> the modern yeah. ancestors swearing to that cross don't mean nothing to me. And immediately Absolutely. you say word, when you say word is bond, you may say anything to the judge, but to your sister. Absolutely. <laughs> this, is, this, is this is it. It's like the Bamana are making oaths to their ancestors. So you bring them into uh, uh, Louisiana French colony and put them in court and say, uh, make this oath to this crucifix over here. They are looking at that like, well, who is this? Because <laughs> my slave master. Right. <laughs> and so they, you know, okay, I'll take this, whatever y'all say, uh, but my oath has already been made and that's to my ancestors. Right. And so when the others say, that's on my mom. As we might they point to Piero and say the Bamana always lie. They they not lying to themselves. <laughs> you know, Professor Porter, you uh, Angie, you you have a quote that I found very well. You have many quotes that are very powerful, but the one that stood out to me right now, I want to share is called. You say resistance not only challenges a thing, it champions another thing, and I think this oh, intellectual man. work demonstrates. Um, the testimony of the truth uh, embedded in that quote. Um, so, you know, um, your your poem, Imagine a World, yes. is so powerful as a tool and technique to make this more concrete as we give life and words to envisioning something different. Can you share some of that? Because I think that very last one of your musing uh, really fits this whole conversation people are having about not wanting to teach African thought and the African orientation to our students today. Yeah. Can you share at least that last one, but yeah. all of them? Well, yes, yeah, so I'll quickly do it. And I know we're low on time, but this actually comes out of just my musings as a kid in Rochester. <laughs> I used to think like, what if we flipped a switch and all the white folks were black? <laughs> but that would have been just subject matter. That would have been race. And now we come to methodology. It's not just skin color that would change. It's the culture would change. The way of doing things would change. The governance would change. So I'll read the last one, um, which is this. Imagine a world where the curriculum at my school, my university, my law school, deeply explores African systems of thought without apology, without controversy, hmm. without question. Hmm. That's a good place for us to pause. Um, this is open source, meaning everybody watching here can get this. Where can they find it? If that's poor. 
Yeah, so I'll give y'all the link, but it's it's through the Michigan Journal of Race and Law. They're an open access journal. So if you look at their current issue, um, the article will be there. That was really important to me. In fact, I only submitted to journals that did that because a lot of journals require you to pay or they have some sort of paywall and that is antithetical to our project. So please uh, feel free to access it. And if you have any trouble, you can always email me and I'll send you uh, the PDF. Okay, and you're already at work on the next uh, building block. And ah, yes, it's gonna hit on a little of what uh, Dr. Watkins just raised, which is the resistance championing championing another thing so. excellent excellent well we'll we'll uh sports have you back when you do that but long time before that because our legal round table will be convening again soon oh yes <laughs> well uh dr watkins i think we can congratulate our colleague huh yes this is a beautiful work of saying kofa it is going to be uh it's such a rich example of um you have raised the bar and it's such a rich example for those who want to follow in your footsteps. So thank you again for this very thoughtful and powerful analysis. And we look forward to your future um, endeavors yes, in yes. this innovative and exciting field known as Africana Legal Studies. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. you. Thank you both. Of course, of course. So we're going to come back in a second and clear the table and get ready for next week here at the Black Star Network's Black Tape. Back in a moment. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn lives. As an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol, we're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Welcome back to the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. And as we clear the table for this week, in the wake of the publication in volume 27, number two of Africana Legal of the Michigan Journal of Race and Law, Africana Legal Studies, New Theoretical Approach to Law and Protocol by Professor Angie Porter, who is an assistant professor of law, of course, at the American University Washington College of Law. Something that our colleague Dr. Watkins said there is absolutely true. Uh, Angie Porter has raised the bar, not just R-A-I-S-E-D, the bar, but uh, potentially R-A-Z-E-D, the bar, <laughs> because uh, <laughs> by reducing law in the Western concept to where it should be, one of a family of discourses and ways of knowing in the human community, and by reimagining how we approach this, Angie Porter has thrown down the gauntlet. She is well equipped to do this. And as she said, she's not the only one who can do this. We can't do it by ourselves. Everyone needs to join this. So if you're out there in high school or elementary school, middle school, you've always dreamed of being a lawyer. You just saw. You just saw what it looks like intellectually. You can do the work that you need to do to advance our project, not only for African people, but for our common humanity. You can do it from where you stand culturally. Again, critical race theory is a very important set of theories and, and concepts, but this, this is something different. This is looking at your mama and saying, the values you taught me, I can use my tools 
to push those values into the world and transform the society. So we are deeply grateful to Angie Porter for doing this. And y'all get this article. We're changing things. And some of y'all say, I never would read a law review article. Well, you read this one because you're going to see yourself on every one of them 72 pages. So we'll see you next week here at the Black Table, here at the Black Star Network. We're very proud of the network. It's growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, join the Bring the Funk fan club. Continue to support us. Download the app. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>